Right. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Ing Min, and I'm a tax partner with Grand Thornton Singapore. Welcome to our inaugural webinar series. There are a number of other topics that we have planned for. Have a look and um, join us if you're interested. I know we may all be very tired, you know, of COVID-19. We'll be very, very tired of all the news around it. But please bear with me. So for today, I'll walk through some of these announcements that has been made. And in an unprecedented, unprecedented manner, you know that uh, this year, Finance Minister Mr. Hing Sui Kiat has delivered three budgets for 2020. We have the first, the unity budget, the usual budget, and that was delivered on 18 Feb. And then we have a second and a third one that was delivered in late March and early April 2020, primarily to deal with the economic fallouts arising from the introduction and extension of the circuit breaker. Now, at the same time, the IRS has also announced additional support measures ranging from extending deadlines for payments, deadlines for filings, as well as uh, and providing clarifications on what would constitute PE or how a company's tax residency is to be determined in light of the uh, travel restrictions uh, after COVID-19. Okay, so in this session, I will first discuss the key highlights of the two recent budgets and the additional measures that the IRS has announced. And then we take a break. I will then do the unity budget. Now, in between the break, we will have uh, the questions and answer sessions for the first part. And then I'll follow uh, with this uh, unity budget. Um, we were trying to sort out on the chat bit whether you could send in questions. Casey, what's the position? Can, can they key in questions or they will have to put it through Mentimeters? At the okay. moment, there still doesn't seem to be a chat, but I'm working on it and I'll just give everyone an update when we get to that section. Okay, thank you, Casey. Right. Let me, let me uh, go look at the agenda. Oh, sorry, there goes my control. Okay, now, this is the first part. The first 20 minutes, I'll be covering all these six items and what you, what you can see in the slides. So I'll touch on JSS, extension of filing deadlines, deferral of tax payment. With COVID-19, you have people stuck in Singapore, they can't go out. So what's the impact on them as an individual? What's the impact on them as a, you know, what's the impact on the company? Sorry, I was trying to do something here. Sorry. What, what's the impact on them as an individual and what's the impact on them uh, as a company. So, so these are the things that were covered in the slides uh, afterwards. And then we move on to unity budget. This is the one that was announced in February. And here I have uh, broadly categorized them into the various group measures that's been announced to help improve cash flows, business sector specific um, announcement, corporate transaction specific announcement, and now one or two others that I would like to highlight. Nothing for personal tax, but still we'll discuss. And then also the goods and services tax. Right, let's look at the job support scheme. Firstly, the job support scheme is only for Singapore citizens and Singapore PR employees. So the purpose of this is really to help keep jobs, keep Singapore citizens and PR employed. And when it was first introduced in the unity budget, it was only 8%. And then it was increased to 25%, and then subsequently 75% in April and May 2020, uh, for April and May 2020. So it will be calculated based on nine months wages, October, November, December, and then Feb to July. And for the other, you know, more industries are more affected, the uh, subsidies, the, the scheme is uh, higher, it's 75% instead of 25%. So this is a very generous scheme. And I think you may have read in the papers or heard over the news in the last few days that a number of companies, 32 companies have returned $32 million to the government. So these people must be, you know, fairly big employer. So it's about, each one of them is like receiving about a million each for the JSS. Now it is really costing the government a lot of money to, to, to implement this scheme. But the basic purpose is really to retain jobs 
And the way it's calculated is, like for example, even for the 75% for the April and the May 2020 uh, wages, the government wants to get the money fast, you know, into the hands of the employer. So therefore, originally started with three tranches of payment, then they increased one, which is the May 2021. And whilst the April and May 2020 is supposed to be calculated based on 75% of the wages for that month, however, you know, because the April 2020 wages is figures not there yet. So what, what, ha what has happened is that um, for the April 2020 75% calculation that was paid in um, April itself, October figure, the October wage figure is actually used as a proxy for the April 2020 figure. And for, no, for November, sorry, for the May 2020 75%, uh, the November wages was actually used as a proxy. So here, I think the purpose you know, behind this is to really encourage uh, employer to keep the employees because at the end of the day, when it comes to the actual payment for April and the actual payment for May, at that point, there will be a true up. So at that point, if the employees is no longer there, then basically whatever that you have gotten in terms of the 75% in October, for October or for November will be clawed back. Uh, in the July and October 2020 payment. And uh, IRS has confirmed that this is not a taxable receipt and it will be calculated automatically um, based on the uh, CPF uh, statement that has been submitted and it will be automatically paid to the uh, accounts that the company actually use for zero payment. And if the company doesn't have any zero payment for tax, then it will be paid to the pay now account of the company and if the company doesn't have either, then a check will be sent. Right, so earlier on I said that about 35, 32 companies have returned 35 million. So this is really, you know, symptomatic of a non-targeted sort of a measure because people, some people don't need it, some people need it. So, but it's given to all and sundry. So, I mean, it's a good thing that people who don't need it has actually made an effort to return it or donate it to help other people who require it during this time. Okay, I'll move on to the extension of filing deadlines now. Now, um, individual tax, you and I, our return is supposed to be due uh, if we e-file by 18th of April. With the extension, I mean, we all know that uh, because of COVID-19, a number of us are all working from home. And uh, because of that, I think uh, IRAS is uh, understanding. They, they know that probably it's harder to get certain things done working from home. So they have actually extended the deadline. So for us as an individual, um, we can file by 31st of May the, uh, 2020 instead of the usual 18 April 2020 uh, deadline. And uh, for ECI, okay, announcement has been only be given for year ending January and February. So you know that uh, for ECI, it's due three months after the year end. So for a January one, it's probably due on 30th April would be May. March will be June. So therefore, technically, unless they make an announcement for a March year end, Jan, Feb, March, all three, the ECI has to be launched by 30th of June. And the GST returns one due, uh, sorry, two days ago, due on the 11th of May. So typically, the GST return, you have to file uh, a month after your quarter end. So this time they give us another 11 days. And for withholding tax uh, form, typically you have to file your withholding tax form and pay your withholding tax by the 15th of the second month following the date of payment. So this one, they've actually extended it for a month to 15 May. Again, nothing said about things that are due on 15 May date of payment. So um, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the extension will be, the, the, those that will be due on 15 uh, May 2020 will be for two months. Uh, I mean, you would have two months of withholding tax return to file. Okay, and then for tax clearance, they're giving a bit more time also. So they are just saying that any tax clearance for employee who have uh, left employment April and May, typically one month, now you have until 30th of June to actually do it. Right, so, so this is the filing deadlines. The next slide is on the extension of uh, payment deadlines. 
So for companies, the, the deferral of payments will first announce for company for three months. For company, if you have anything, any payment that's due in May, June, sorry, April, May, June, this will automatically be uh, rescheduled such that you'll be, will now be due in July, August, and September of 2020. And this deferral is automatic. Uh. So if you have, you're on a zero payment, there's anything that's due in April, May, or June, it will all be moved to July, August, September. Okay, and for individuals, if you, okay, the, the, the three months deferral uh, comes in from May, June, and July. So it was a later part that uh, this bid was announced. And um, this deferral means that anything that's due in May, June, July, 2020 would now be due in August, September, and October. Now for self-employed individuals, this deferment is automatic. For employees, you need to go and opt in. You need to go to the IRAS website. There's a place for you to go and opt in to say that, to key in and then send your request over to say that you would like to have this uh, deferral. You would like to enjoy this extension of the payment deadlines. Right. I'll now move on to tax residency of a company. Now, before we look at the travel restriction, we look at the tax, you know, how, how would you determine a company is tax resident in Singapore? You look at where the control and management of the company is in. So if the control and management of a company is in Singapore, then the company is considered tax resident company generally, but there are certain specific, uh, I mean, more special rules pertaining to wholly owned foreign company, which I will not cover. So generally, I will just, uh, I mean, I will just zero in on this control and management of the company uh, principle. Based on case law, the control and management of the company is the location of the board of directors meeting. So where the board of directors hold their meeting, that would determine where the control and management of the company is. So for example, if I am a Singapore tax resident company, I cannot hold board of directors meeting in Singapore in FY 2020 because my directors can't travel here. They're stuck. Because of the travel restriction, they can't come here and I can't hold board of directors meeting here in Singapore. So what does that mean to me, to my company? So IRAS has come to the rescue. So IRAS say that as long as you were a tax resident in the year before, that is now FY 2019. So as long as you are a tax resident in the year before and nothing has changed in terms of your business model. So everything is BAU, business as usual for you. Nothing has changed then although you're not, you're unable to hold any director, board of directors meeting in Singapore, you will still be considered a tax resident in Singapore. So, so that's one side of the call, you know, for people who want to be tax resident of Singapore, but they can't hold meeting here. Then we have another group of people who potentially may be stuck also. They are not tax resident of Singapore, but because of the travel restriction, they have no choice but the whole board of directors meeting in Singapore. Now, in this case, again, on the other side of it, what the IRAS wants is that, firstly, you must not be a tax resident in Singapore in the year before, no change to your business model, then even though you hold board of directors meeting in Singapore, you will not be considered a tax resident of Singapore. Okay, so bottom line is you need evidence. So you need to make sure that you have you keep documentary evidence to substantiate your claims either way, whether you are resident or non-resident. So this is purely on the board of directors meeting as well. Like I said earlier on, for a wholly owned foreign company, there are some other conditions. Those conditions will continue to apply. Okay, so, so that's the company, tax residency of company due to travel restriction. Then next, we look at a concept, another concept in tax, which is what we call a permanent establishment. Now, let's say you are a foreign company. You have an employee based in Singapore. And uh, this is actually unplanned. You, you don't intend for this person to be here because one of the ways you can actually trigger a PE is having in Singapore for a certain period of time, depending if there are treaties, we look at the treaties as to how long you can have an employee here before you can, before it will trigger a PE. So the bottom line with a PE concept is, if you have a PE in Singapore, 
And then under the treaties that Singapore has with a number of countries, if you have a PE in Singapore, any profits attributable to that PE will be subject to tax in Singapore. So, but if this guy is here because it's due to the travel restriction, unplanned, he's not intended to be here in the first place, then perhaps you know you may be able to sort of like explain your way away, you know, explain to the IRS why you know his unplanned presence should not constitute a PE for your company, for the foreign company in Singapore. So there are a couple of conditions. Number one, you don't have a P in Singapore in the year before, and there's no change in your business model. And whatever, although it's unplanned, the presence in Singapore is temporary. It's, it's not intended to be, you know, you, you didn't send this guy here for some, uh, you know, to, to do something for more than, say, 183 days. And in the absence of COVID-19, absent that, this sort of activities would have been performed outside of Singapore rather than in Singapore. And um, yeah, again, you have to keep relevant documents and records to basically um, substantiate your case if the IRS asks for it. Right, so okay, so that's the PE one. Then we look at um, employment income. Now, basic principle, the source of the employment income will be where the employment is exercised. So if you're exercising employment in Singapore, you would have a taxable presence here by virtue of the fact that you are carrying out your work, you know, you're carrying out, you're exercising your employment here in Singapore. So you know that at the start of uh, COVID-19, a number of Singaporeans have actually returned from overseas. Um, they have actually come back to Singapore for all sorts of reasons. And some of them are actually stuck here. So they, are, they continue to, you know, nowadays, even like today, I'm working from home. It's, it's, it's quite easy for people to be telecommuting, working from any, play, any other place other than their usual place of uh, employment. So it is possible that some of these people are actually working from home in Singapore for an overseas employer, say in UK or you in US. So as a concession, but only up to 30th September, depending on whether IRAS, you know, how this uh, COVID-19 thing pan out, whether IRAS will actually uh, extend it. So up to 30th September, the uh, Singapore citizen, clearly here only applies to Singapore citizen and Singapore permanent resident. If you are exercising employment in Singapore from the date of return to Singapore until 30th of September 2020 for your overseas employment. No change in that contractual term of your employment, still the same term. Then, in this case, you will not be considered to be exercising the overseas employment in Singapore, which means to say you don't have a taxable presence on the employment income here in Singapore, although you actually exercise employment in Singapore. Okay, so, but this one will be reviewed after 30th, September 2020. And the next one I'm actually looking at before we have a short break is on non-resident foreign employees in Singapore. So, so you may have people who are stuck here because they can't go back uh, because of the travel restriction. So in this case, we have this what we call a short-term uh, short term employee visiting employees concession. So you have in Singapore for a period of not more than 60 days, you technically would not be considered, you, uh, you, you, although you're exercising employment in Singapore, that employment income will be exempt from tax under our exemption. So therefore you can actually, uh, a foreign employee can actually work in Singapore for up to 60 days and not be taxable in Singapore. So with this extension, you, the, the, the extension is only for another 60 days. So if you have been here for 50 days, let's say, you know, you still qualify for the short-term visiting employee concession, then um, you extend it further because you can't go back. So this concession basically say that you have another 60 days to go. So 50 plus 60, you can be here for 110 days without, you know, triggering a Singapore tax exposure. But there is a condition that you have to prove that what you do here is not connected with your original assignment and you would have gone back and performed it overseas if not because of COVID-19 restriction, travel restriction. 
so so I mean the the evidence you know the onus of uh, substantiating it is still with the taxpayer to show that they meet uh, these conditions. Huh? Right. So I'm come to end. I have come to the end of the first part, and we are now on to the questions. Hi. Um, Hi. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, you're saying that um, IRS has confirmed that the job support scheme will, will not be a taxable receipt, right? And will do we record under other income or do we credit a payroll expense? I think because it's not going to be a taxable event, a taxable receipt. I would rather you record it as other income so that we can do the tax adjustment easily. Because if you net it off against your, you know, your wages, then it's hard to tell. Right. With tax comp, we need to do the tax adjustment. So I, I, I don't think it's really a question of how you should be recording it that really matters for tax. But mm -hmm. rather, I'm looking at it from the angle of how easy it is to extract the number for the tax comp. Right. So, so if we booked it under other income, it's easier to, for us yeah, to identify call it JSS. that amount. Yeah, call it JSS. So then, you okay. know, when we do the tax computation, it's easy. We know that this is not a taxable item, we just take it out. Right. All right. And another question is, um, okay, if the company went into MVL, the voluntary liquidation from 1st oh. of July, example, so because April, because of this um, job support scheme, right, they will kind of receive like... Um, uh, this um, amount from the government and then when July is true up will the money be asked to pay back by the company in spirit I think yes but if the company has gone to MVR I don't know what is going to be the legal position but yes that that is exactly what the government is actually saying to the employer keep your people employed especially in during the circuit breaker period of uh, May April and May so if you, you know, if, if people are not employed during this period, then um, you have to return the 75% that has been given to you earlier on. Right, sure, thanks. Thank you. Right, any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, if there's no question, I've actually said about 10 minutes for this. I just want to sort of like share one other part, you know, pertaining to IRAS doing this, IRAS doing that. Now, Singapore being the little red dot, IRAS may say that, okay, you are considered resident, non-resident company. But I think for a bigger picture for the, you know, for multinational companies that has got operations all over the place, maybe the important thing that you also need to look at is how would your other jurisdiction actually view it? I mean, to be fair to IRAS, those are outside of their control. As in, you know, they can only tell you how Singapore would treat it. But how other countries would actually, you know, deal with it is something that um, I think multinationals would have to look at in, in this period. Uh, because of that, you know, unprecedented sort of uh, situation where lots of us are not in the place that we used to be, you know, to do our usual, to carry out our usual duties. Uh. So, so that's what. And then before that, um, my GST colleague has actually asked me one question. Uh, as to why IRAS is silent on that, I don't know the answer, but uh, I'll just, you see, because I'll just highlight it, because for GST, um, if you're providing it as a fringe benefit um, for accommodations, you know, for less than 60 days or whatever, the GST as a concession, the input GST on it is claimable. So, but IRAS is silent now, so I don't know whether they will extend it, you know, because now that we had this concession to say that, okay, you're here for, what, originally less than 60 days, then you had to stay for another 60 days out of your control, then we still consider you as not exercising employment in Singapore. So then, if, if that's the case, then what about, you know, if you're staying in some sort of a service apartment, if there are some GST on some of these calls, would the same concession, you know, be granted? Actually, I don't know the answer, but uh, we, we can actually feedback to IRAS and see whether more clarifications will be provided or not. Because at the moment, they have fo focused only on the direct tax part, whether it's on the individual or on the company because of these uh, travel restrictions. Uh, Casey, any question on menti uh, Mentimeter? No, no questions so far. No questions so far. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll just move on to the second part now. Can you give control back to me? Yep, you should just be able to click share screen. Okay, let me try. Uh. Uh. 
Okay, right. Okay, so I'll just move on to the unity budget, which we couldn't do a budget seminar then because of COVID-19 and we're not sure whether we could do it on a webinar, but now we are ready. Okay, now for the uh, unity budget, I have actually broadly categorized them into a few categories. Now the first one that we're going to talk about is those uh, items that has been introduced to improve cash flow. I mean, at that time was bad, but maybe it wasn't as bad as now. I mean, 18 Feb. So I'll broadly categorize them into those that will help improve cash flows and those are industry specifics and so on. So I'll start with the one on improving cash flow. Okay, corporate tax, income tax rebate. So now before I look at what's been changed, maybe we take a step back and look at the three main components of a corporate tax calculation in Singapore. So you can't just look at the headline tax rate and say, oh, tax rate 17%. Actually, it's not really 17. It will be a bit lower than 17. Why? Because of two things. Because of what we have, what we call a partial tax exemption, a partial exemption, partial income tax exemption. Now, this partial income tax exemption in the past it used to be up to 300,000, and then it was announced in a 2018 budget that come YA 2020, it had been reduced. I used to call this the 152500 you know, calculation. Now it becomes 105200. Uh, sorry, 102500 calculation. So in the past, the first 75% of the first 10,000 and 50% of the next 290,000 will be exempt from tax. Going forward, it will be 75% of 10 and then 50% of 190,000. So this would effectively bring down your um, corporate tax uh, rate la, because after you deduct this, then the balance, you take it at 17%. So at a low income level, low chargeable income level for corporate, your headline tax rate is less than 17%. Your effective tax rate is less than 17%. Okay, so if you only have 100,000 chargeable income, I've calculated, it's about 6.06% .06 only. Okay, so there are two parts. So first, the corporate tax rebate, uh, sorry, the corporate, the partial tax exemption. Next, the corporate tax rebate. Now, the corporate tax rebate in YA 2019 was 20% of the tax payable cap at 10k. So for YA 2020, it's 25% cap at 15. So it has increased. So basically to help uh, corporates, you know, improve their cash flow, give more money back to them. And yesterday uh, we saw that uh, this, this also contribute to the 16 billion that has been used uh, in the COVID-19 uh, assistance that the government has given. Now, when it comes to corporate income tax rebate, it is only useful if the company is in a tax paying position. If you're already in a bad shape that you're in some losses or whatever, then this is co comfort uh, because whilst it's there, you can't actually use it. Uh. And also for you to fully, fully maximize the um, amount, you will have to make sure that your, you know, the income level has to be fairly high. Uh. I've actually calculated for you to enjoy the whole 15,000, you must have a chargeable income level of about far as 60,000 in order to get a full 15,000 rebate. So if you're in a loss for making, if you're a loss making company or if you're a company that has got a fairly uh, low chargeable income, this is not much of a help to you. Okay, so let me move on to the next one, which is also part of the, you know, measures to improve cash flow. This is the enhancement of the loss carry back relief scheme. All other conditions remain. What it means is that in the past, you can only carry back for one year. With this enhancement in YA 2020, you can carry back up to three immediate preceding year of assessment. So you, you have a choice. Uh, let's say if you are in the loss position now, you can carry back, you know, you can look back the last three years and see which year you can actually carry back to uh, and then get a refund from the IRAs. Uh. Now there is a cap and the cap is 100,000, no change from before. So really just giving you like the extra, you know, number of years that you can bring back. And then um, to, to help ease cash flow, IRAs is prepared for you to do the carry back um, before you file your YA 2020 return. And you all know that, um, 
we are supposed to file our YA 2020 return by 30th November or 15th December, you know, depending on um, whether you e-file or not. However, the forms are actually not ready yet. Uh, I think it will be out soon, early June, I think, for us to really do, to complete the filing for YA 2020. So because of that, but IRAS is open on this. They are prepared for you to actually um, do an estimated calculation based on 2020 return, do a carry back, and once they do the amended assessment, they will refund you. They, they will return you the tax that has been overpaid. So my question to you now is, should you? Should you do a carry back? Yes or no? And what are the conditions that you need to look at? Okay, your, the company's position. The first thing that I've discussed is, uh, the first point that I have here is the effective tax rate. And this is tied into what we have discussed earlier on about the corporate tax rate in Singapore. Looks like 17%, but actually not. It depends on your income level because of the partial tax exemption as well as the corporate tax rebate. So if you carry back and you are in a position where your income level is not high, so if your effective tax rate is 6%, 6.06%, like what I said on the first 100,000, when you carry back, you just get a benefit of 6,000 and not a full 17% uh, percent of 100,000. So it really depends on your position. If you think that you're going to be more profitable in the future, that will push your tax rate you know, to the next level, then perhaps you should you know, reconsider that decision. So it really depends. And then also how difficult it is. Because you know that you need to file ECI. If you are in a lost position for YA 2020, are you in a, going to be in a profitable position in YA 2021? If that's the case, it may be easier for you to just set off that loss against your ECI computation for YA 2021 than to do a loss carry back. So, but these, these are some of the things that I think that people should consider in deciding whether to you know, do it or not. Right. So let's move on to the other cash flow improving measures. Okay, now this one really is a timing difference. And it is only of value if this item in question does not qualify for a one-year capital allowance. And this is an irrevocable option. So basically what it means is that if you have $1,000 that you can only claim over three years in the past, for YA 2021, you have an option of doing 75% of that cost claiming 75% of that CA in YA 2021 and another 25% in the following year. So instead of like, you know, one third, one third, one third over three years, you do 75, 25. So it's just a pure timing difference, allow you to claim faster and maybe, you know, it would enable you to do a, some carry back. So th that's what, you know, in, in, in my next point that I ask, should you? Should you accelerate the claim? Okay. Do you want to do it so that, you know, you utilize it in this year, but is it really beneficial for you to do it? And, um, or do you want to do it so that you can do a carry back? But carry back, you have all those effective tax rate considerations that I've discussed. You know, whether it's really beneficial or not to do that, to do the carry back. And then, if you are a 10E company, 10E is a special class of companies uh, where if they have unabsorbed CA, they cannot carry forward. So if unabsorbed CA means uh, capital allowances that they cannot fully utilize. Let's say you do the 75% in YA 2021 and you cannot fully utilize. Or even if you move over to YA 2022 and you do the 25% CA uh, claim and you can't fully utilize it, then you'll be gone. So, so you also have to be mindful of your own position as to whether any of these uh, rules will kick in and affect um, your ability to carry forward these uh, unabsorbed capital allowances. Because this rule, once you exercise it, is irrevocable. So if you exercise the option to do 75-25, that's it. You have to continue to do it between 2021 and 2022. So if you have gone on the other options of like one third, you know, claim over three years, you can defer and trigger the claim as and when you require. Okay, so this is, okay. I'll move on to another one, which is similarly 
a timing difference because the cap of 300,000 remains the same. And this one basically, this, this is the R&R, &R, renovation and refurbishment expense claim. This is the one where you do not need any uh, controller of uh, buildings approval on the expenses you incurred. And these are the, this, this category of expenses are those in between. They're not revenue expense, they're not plan. They're in between. They're nobody's child, but yet it's something that you need to incur in order to carry out, you know, to continue, you know, to, to carry out your business or get your business model ready. So as a concession, after many years of talking about it, this number was actually increased from 100 to 300,000 now. But still there's a cap. So over three years, you can claim a maximum of 300,000. So now with what, in YA 2021, you can accelerate it. Instead of claiming over three years, you can claim over one year. But because the cap of 300,000 still apply, if you have done some claim the year before, and you have maxed it out, then too bad, la, you get nothing. La. If the three years in the three years for the 300,000 includes YA 2021, then you can't get uh, any more. And uh, if let's say up to that inclusive of YA 2021, three years, you have another 30,000, then technically you can claim that 30,000 either over one year or three years, depending on how you want to do it. La. So similarly, this is just to improve the cash flow. It's just a timing difference. Whether you do it or not really depends. Uh, so you will have to assess your position. Is it beneficial? Should you do it? Can you do it? Yes, there is this uh, relaxation, but uh, is it of any value to the company? So those are the questions that you will need to ask yourself. Okay, right. I'll move on to the next slide, which is a bit dated now because of all these other announcement pertaining to um, the date, uh, you know, the deferral in the corporate tax payment. However, I mean, it's still relevant from the angle that uh, the current, the number of installment plan has been extended and it is for ECI launch um, during this period from 19 Feb, budget was uh, 18. Eh? So from 19 Feb 2020 to 31st December 2020, so if you have ongoing installment plan payments planned during this period, I believe IRAS would have automatically sent you the amended uh, Zyro statement already. Yeah? Okay, and then plus whatever that I discussed earlier on, the additional announcement that was made on the deferral of tax payment, you have even more time to settle your tax uh, liability. Okay, I will now move on to the business uh, sector incentive. Be, I would not be going through them in great details. I'll just touch and go to just to give you an idea of what has been announced at the uh, Unity budget. Okay, the first one is the funds. Now, this is a 13H one, and um, it's, a, it's an extension and a refinement. So firstly, it has been extended to 31st December 2025. So otherwise, it would have lapsed already. And then in terms of extension is previously under 13H, you have got a separate list, you know, a separate class of uh, income that will be covered. With this extension, the SIDI list would uh, be applicable to 13H scheme as well. SIDI as in specified income from a designated investment. So this, 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 this list would also apply to a 13H company. And... Um, the other extension is you can claim GST on expenses as a, at a fixed recovery rate and foreign incorporated companies or Singapore VCC may qualify for the 13H exemption. Uh, okay, and then the statutory limitation on, on the incentive has been removed and incentive can be awarded for a maximum five years. So it's, it's a bit more flexible now in terms of uh, the location of a 13H. It can be a foreign company. So, so basically, 13H has been extended. So in terms of the SIDI list, so previously it's a, a, a more narrow list. And then on the GST bit, you can have some recovery. And it has been extended to cover foreign companies as well as Singapore VCC. La, so that, you know, the entity set up, um, the top entity that you could use for a 13H exemption has been sort of like expanded. Right. I'll just move on to the next one now. 
This is the marine term sector incentive. Again, this one is just an extension, okay, to 31st December 2026. And um, it also it ha has also been enhanced to cover some in-house ship management income under the MSI AIS award. And um, the, the interesting one is this um, allowing income from operating of ship provisionally registered in Singapore um, exemptions regardless of whether a permanent registration is obtained. Uh, because in the past, eventually, so for Singapore registered uh, vessels operating in international water, the shipping income is exempt from tax. So in the past, when you have a provisional registration, it will, the, the exemptions will be granted to you. However, if you eventually don't get a permanent registration, there will be a clawback. So with this enhancement, you don't have, you know, ship owners doesn't have to worry about this part of it. Right? And then the last bit is on the stamp duty remission. This one will lapse after 1st of June 2021. So we have got some enhancement and some uh, withdrawal of some incentives that's been provided. Okay. Right, okay. And then we have this uh, insurance uh, business development. This, this is the one where they have subsumed the IBD scheme for marine hall and liability insurance after it's lapsed uh, under the uh, IBD itself. And it's the 10% concession. And similarly for GTP, what they have done is that for structural commodity financing is subsumed under GTP. Lah. So it's not, it will not separately be a standalone. So it's, it's just a refinement. Lah. But when it comes to GTP, I mean, sometimes the, con, the consideration that uh, maybe IRAS, MOF or whatever would have to think about is uh, what happened in the home country of these foreign investors. Uh, Whilst we may give them the concession and uh, because of some rules in the other uh, countries that will actually claw back all the low tax, you know, that has been paid overseas, then maybe it may not be of much of a value to the investors uh, to attract them to come here. Okay, I'll just move on very quickly. I realize I only have about 15 minutes to go and continue. Okay, I'll just move on to the corporate transactions. Okay, there are two that I've, I'm going to talk about, which is the merger and acquisition scheme, which personally I have not uh, helped any client with, uh, but uh, I suppose it's um, available. Some, some people may have used it. Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, now um, this scheme has been extended and then the stamp duty bit has been, it's a uh, will lapse. Uh, and then um, there's, and some enhancement, but I put it in inverted comma, so it's not an enhancement. So basically, I'm taking away the waiver that has been previously granted for non-Singapore incorporated holding companies. So now it has to be uh, Singapore companies. We have narrowed it down to Singapore companies only. Okay. I just would like to spend a little bit more time on this one. This is a 13 Zac one. Now, 13 ZAC, um, it's, the, it's, it's, it's to give the company some certainty on disposal of ordinary shares under some prescribed circumstances. Huh? So basically what it says is that if you hold at least 20% of the shares for a minimum of 24 months just before you dispose it, then um, it will be exempt from tax. So, so this is like a safe harbor rule to give uh, corporate some assurance that uh, this will not be a taxable event, given that whilst there's no capital gains tax in Singapore, the revenue capital divide sometimes can be quite difficult to address la, you know, as to whether this transaction is undertaken for revenue gain or was it really a capital transaction? We go back to the batches of trade and then we need to do a fair bit of analysis and you need to do a lot of work to basically substantiate it if the IRAs challenge you on this. Okay, so, so this scheme, was, uh, has been extended to uh, 31st December 2027. It was uh, from May 2020 uh, extended, so it's about five years plus. Uh. But if you look at this scheme, uh, you realize that there's a 24 months holding period. So the extension looked like five years plus, but in order to meet the 24 months holding period, you have to buy a bit earlier. Uh. So 
it's only about three, three years plus uh, in terms of extension in order to meet the 24 months holding requirement. Okay, and uh, right from the start, this scheme don't apply to insurance company. They are different kettle of fish altogether. And then it also doesn't apply to companies in the business of trading or holding immovable uh, properties other than in the business of uh, property development for sale in Singapore. So, so originally it just don't apply to, uh, you know, it is a trading or holding Singapore immovable properties. So if you are, uh, you know, holding it as an investment, so this, this concession don't apply lah, because I think they didn't want to incentivize this sort of uh, company to basically just hold properties and then sell the property and the gains is not taxed. Lah. Okay, so originally that was the only exclusion for Singapore immovable, uh, Singapore company in the business of trading or holding uh, immovable properties. However, in this budget, there has been some further new restriction that has been announced. Now the situation is, if you look at the words that I've highlighted, so, so it's basically all now, whether it's in the business of trading, holding or developing immovable properties, and whether it's in Singapore or outside or overseas. So as long as you have this sort of a company, 13Z don't apply. So that, that new restriction I thought was quite restrictive, but you know, especially for the overseas investment, because probably overseas you would have all sorts of taxes that would have been paid there. But basically the new 13Z going forward will not apply to companies dealing with immovable properties, whether in Singapore or outside in whatever capacity. Right, let me just move on to some other things that has been announced in the scheme. Okay, the capital grants bit. Okay, now this, this one, huh, uh, in the past, what, what the IRAS has actually done to get, I mean, in the past is this, because I think, no, or, or rather what the taxpayer, a lot of taxpayer has done, and even to the point where SIATP has actually provided some clarification on it pertaining mainly to the capital allowances bit. So if you, are, if you are given a grant to purchase a plant and machinery, so under the Income Tax Act, if you have incurred the expense on the plant and machinery, you can claim capital allowances. So you, you go ahead and claim capital allowances. Then after the event, you receive um, capital grants from some authorities. You will tell IRAS, this capital grants is a capital grants. So it's not a taxable event, so I should not be taxed. And then at the same time, you claim capital allowances on the full amount. So it's double incentivizing. So come 1st January 2021, you, you can't do this anymore. So it's make very clear, if you have any expense or making any capital allowances claim for which a grant has been granted, then you can only claim net of it. So for those of you who remember PIC, it's always net of grant. So now, I, now MOF has actually made it very clear through this announcement that it has to be whatever you claim in terms of your CA or your tax deduction, net of grant. And the other thing that has been announced is the uh, streamlining of the sixth schedule. So it's just making it simpler now. You have only like three options, six, 12, or 16 years. So, so they are like, instead of having like a whole list, you know, that you have to pick as to where your equipment will fall under. So if the current prescribed life is like 12 years or less, you choose six or 12. If it's 12 years, then, sorry, if it's 16 years, then you can choose 6, 12, or 16. So you can narrow it down to three lifespan, three working life. Okay. Now, in the next uh, slide, I basically show you what are some of these uh, incentives that has been extended, enhanced, or whether it has lapsed. So the first one is actually the DT. DI, the double tax deduction for internalization scheme. Now do take note that it's been extended to 31st December 2025. And more importantly, it, the, the, scope, the scope of expenses qualifying for double tax deduction has been expanded. So I think it's worth looking at it to see whether you have any third party consultancy costs for your overseas project, because these, these are now uh, items that you can actually claim for double tax deduction. So, uh, and then if you have got any fees in, uh, incurred on speaking spots to pitch products, transport of materials, samples during the business mission, third party consulting costs, these are all now uh, qualifying for double tax deduction under this scheme. 
Okay. Now the next one is the FTC. I won't say much other than the fact that it's been extended and the lease of qualifying funds and activities expanded. And LIA, I don't know whether you remember when LIA was first introduced, not long after that, the IBA scheme or around about the same time the IBA sort of like expire, but it has never been, uh, LIA has never been introduced to replace uh, IBA. It is more to encourage intensify, uh, uh, intensification of uh, land use. So if you look at you know, the gloss plot ratio, so the, the better plot ratio you have, the better chance of you getting um, the LIA schema. Right, so, and then the next one, which is very telco specific, I will not talk about it, which is uh, writing down allowance for IRU, just include for completeness. I'll just move on to 14E, which is a further uh, tax deduction scheme under for R&D. Now this one will lapse. Uh, Oh, sorry, has lapsed uh, because it's 31st March uh, 2020. So going forward, people will have to go under the uh, 14DA, which is um, you get another 150% on top of your 100% uh, R&D expense. Now, the only vast difference between 14E and 14DA is 14E, you need to make an application. You got some approval, so you may have some certainty. Where else 14DA is less certain. So you may want to do some extra work, you know, if you're claiming under 14DA to have some clarity on the items, on, on, on whether it will qualify as an R&D, whether the, the project that you will be doing will qualify as an R&D project. Okay, I'll move on to personal tax now. Okay, right. Actually, personal tax, nothing much to say to you. I think you all know, no change, right? No rate change no rebates that we all, all, all were hoping for but i think there were some other forms of uh, non-tax measures that were announced uh. so personally i feel that together with the uh, eighty thousand cap and the current tax rate so maybe what um, we will achieve is um, a more progressive uh, and equitable personal tax regime uh, where people who can afford would have to pay more tax so that you know it can be redistributed somehow to people who need help. So for for um, personal tax, no change. And then there's some three other announcements on uh, individuals. I think basically um, the in angel investor tax deduction scheme that one will lapse. I think it's fine. And then the withholding tax for non-resident mediators and non-resident arbitrators. This one is extended. The more interesting one is the concessionary withholding tax rate of 10% for non-resident public entertainers. Okay, first thing, two announcements. Number one, extended to 31st uh, March 2020. And at the same time, it was announced that there will be no further extension after that. We revert back to 15% post uh, the uh, 31st March 2020. So maybe we have done enough to attract all the race car drivers or all the performers who come to Singapore. So we don't need to give them that concessionary treatment. However, post-COVID, don't know whether this will change or not. But as is now, this is the announcement. And um, I'll just move to goods and services tax. Okay, I think we know one thing now. The increase will be to 9%, somewhere between 2022 and 2025, and not 2021 and 2025. So I think... We all know the increase is inevitable. The question is really when. And uh, in the unity budget, finance minister has also announced a support package of $4 billion, uh, although the year of uh, increase has not been uh, confirmed yet. And also, maybe you know the fact that we have our reverse charge and our OVR, which is effective for 1st January this year, this, this will help you know, contribute some revenues to the government's coffer and maybe it will help store this a bit. I, I don't know, it's just my guess. Right, thank you for your patience. I've come to the end of my presentation. So we have like about two, three minutes for some questions. Anybody has any questions? Casey, see any on mental uh, uh, mentee? No question submitted. Okay. 
Right. Um, well, if there are no question, thank you for attending this session. I hope you'll join us in our other further uh, future sessions. And if you have any other questions that you that come to your mind after this session, please just feel free to drop me an email or drop Casey an email. She'll forward it to me. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing you at our other uh, sessions. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>